Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's wonderful to learn more about Dr. Armamini. Um, it's really an honor to be asked to give this lecture and especially in light of um, his legacy, clearly in terms of training many generations of surgeons. And thank you to the San Jose Surgical Society for sponsoring um, this lecture for so many years before Dr. Hahn and her team took it on. My disclosures are, um, as mentioned, I am a board director, um, but these views expressed here today um, are my own um, and don't necessarily represent official opinions of the ABS, though I think they're pretty aligned. Um, but I am really so excited about EPAs. Um, it's rare, I think, you know, for any of us who engage in research to get to see something that you've worked on translate into practice during the course of your career. And I, this is sort of how I feel about um, seeing EPA is actually rolling out now across the country uh, to everyone, because I think it is really seeing a pivot in how we think about assessment for our trainees um, and finally heading, I don't say finally, but heading the right direction um, in terms of how we as surgeons think about what's important um, for training a surgeon. So I think to get anybody on board with asking people to massively change how they do things, it's always important to start with the why. And so I like to start with understanding what are we trying to fix? What, what do we feel like needs to be better? And so for me, it really is distilled down into these sort of four big um, bucket areas. I think for all of us you know, over the years, um, we've just seen a, con a continual layering on of additional assessment tools, oftentimes very, very long, kind of long form checklists and things that we have to do that we don't necessarily, and certainly the residents don't necessarily feel like they bring a lot of value. We're sort of checking boxes to meet requirements. Um, and the burden of that work over the years has also really accumulated for faculty. It's been immense. The ACGME worked to try to move towards a competency-based framework for training, which I think conceptually all makes sense, right? Like a surgeon should, when we turn a surgeon out into the world, that we should feel like they're competent, right? That's what we want for our friends and family and ourselves. Um, but how do we get there? How do we get to that competency-based framework? So the journey that you know, the ACGME has been on with respect to developing the competencies initially, followed by the milestones, which were better, but still felt really artificial to us. Um, I think for anyone who's filled out an evaluation form and you're like, how is Jane Smith in systems-based practice? You know, it's like, she's a four, because I like her. Or how are they doing in well-being? Well, they look like they work out a lot, so they must be really, really well. So, I mean, we just have not had good tools. It has been very artificial and it's not how we take care of patients, right? I'm a pancreas surgeon. If you ask me, in the, you know, how is this trainee, assistance-based practice, practice-based learning, improving, et cetera, like, you know, my eyes roll back in my head versus, and then you ask, you know, for 50 milestones related to that, it, it's, it just doesn't sort of conceptually make sense. If you ask me, you know, would you trust them to evaluate and manage your mother with pancreas cancer? I can get to that really quick because I know exactly what that looks like and I can conceptualize it and I can tell you where they need, where they are trustable and where they're not. So the competency framework, while important, really hadn't quite gotten us there. And I think EPAs take us to that final uh, next step. So they're also, from the public standpoint, if we think about all the different stakeholder groups from the public standpoint, that you know, our training has really been a black box um, in terms of transparency for increasing autonomy. And if you talk to a bunch of risk attorneys for hospitals, which we've done, they will tell you that the framework that we're about to roll out or are rolling out now that it's past July, makes them so much happier because it actually has some data and some transparency around it versus, you know, we all go into the room and the lights go off and people change spots in the room and, and who knows who's doing what in that situation and who knows who's really able to do what and how do we advance them so that they have increasing autonomy during their training program. And so um, we need increased transparency for our public stakeholders. And I think for anyone who's given the boards, we produce a really great product in the United States, but it's a heterogeneous product. And so for anyone who gives the boards, you know, you have some people who like knock it out of the park and I'm go see where they're, who they are, where they are after I get the exam so I can hire them one day. And then there are other people who I'm like, gosh, they passed, but ooh, you know, just barely. So, and that doesn't give you a lot of confidence, right? You're like, where are they going to be practicing? And and I hope they have a narrow practice. And nobody feels good about that, especially the program director who's asked to sign off on all of these you know, certificates at the end to say that they're ready. And I, you, know, you hear, if you go to the program director's meeting, these conversations of, well, we try to guide people to have a practice where they're gonna be a safe surgeon, but like, we should have a more consistent product at the end of the day. Doesn't mean people will 
not be able to do more or less things, but there should be a floor below which we say to the public, every board certified surgeon can do these things and are competent to do them. So from my perspective, these are the four sort of problems we've been trying to solve um, for many, many years. I think importantly, this is not a flash in the pan. This has been a long journey of competency-based education and I'm not gonna walk through all these boxes, but I would just highlight going all the way back to 2005, this conversation really started in earnest about um, this feeling that we need to do something different, um, that what we're doing is probably not where we need to be. And so there were a number of initiatives over the years. And then in 2015, Canada, the Royal College of Surgeons and Physicians launched um, Competency by Design. I will say for, to this audience, I don't need to tell you um, all from a tech standpoint, but sometimes it's better to be second rather than first um, because some of the ways that they've rolled out, we've been able to learn from them and adapt our approach um, to be a bit more accessible. Um, I was just the Canadian meetings uh, before coming here and there was an outcry because their EPA assessment forms are very long and very checklisty and, and there hasn't been a lot of sort of buy-in and um, excitement about that. And they're, they're actually really excited about what we've developed in the States and are now looking to pull it back. So, so we've been able to learn from others who have walked, um, walked this walk before us and that's been really helpful. The ABS then went to um, the Netherlands to meet with someone who will talk more about Ali Tinkati, um, who really developed this concept of EPAs. And then we were sort of all in. We developed um, a pilot and uh, moved on to declare through the board that this was gonna be the way that we did um, competency-based assessment going forward. And then obviously, as Dr. Hahn said in July, we went live. So what is this construct and, and why am I so excited about it? So I think, you know, one of the things I really like about it is it's based on this concept of progressive entrustment. I think for any of us who are surgeons, we work in a very high stakes environment. We have an obligation to the patient. We have all sorts of regulatory requirements that we have to be obligated to. Um, and, and it's high stakes and it's high stakes on our shoulders. Yet, if we don't impart progressive autonomy to our trainees, we've just moved the safety concern down the road where we, we turn out a lot of surgeons who've never done a case by themselves and now they're on their own um, with no sort of support system around them. And that's a different safety concern. Now it's not maybe on our shoulders directly, but, um, but now they're sort of left um, on their own, not realizing what they didn't know um, before they started. So this idea of they're peeling the onion layers back and prog providing progressive entrustment, but with supervision um, by faculty is really what we mean by progressive entrustment. And I will just tell you all, and this includes me, um, that we are terrible <laughs> at peeling back our supervision. It's really hard to be in the room and not fix the retractor and not you know, fix all the little things that make the case seem really, really smooth until you're out in practice. And anyone who remembers their first year in practice will remember how hard that first whatever case was because you suddenly realized how much help you were getting across the table. Um, but it is hard for faculty, requires a lot of faculty development to be present in the room and not take over every aspect of the case. And we've um, looked at this extensively um, and it's universally true. So, um, for me, the best definition of trust, as I think about this with residents, is um, comes down to this definition of acceptable uncertainty. So this is my son, he's gonna be 16 next Wednesday. We bought him a car um, and we have, I hope, acceptable uncertainty that when we give him the keys, that he is you know, not gonna do some bonehead thing and get in the car and do something stupid. Um, that he's driven enough that, you know, he's not gonna run over someone or run the car off the road. Is there uncertainty? Absolutely. Um, but it, ultimately we have to turn over the keys and it's the same thing when you turn over the right angle, right? We have to turn over the right angle to the residents and we have to trust that we've seen them enough um, and we trust them enough and we believe that we could get them out of trouble if need be, um, that they can take the keys. Um, and so I think this is something for anyone who has kids can relate to, and I think it's very applicable to what we're talking about in residency training. So Ali Tinkati um, goes on to define, to break trust down into these four core concepts. And I really like his sort of definition because again, I think it has a lot of relevance for um, our setting in terms of training residents. So Ali is a PhD at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. and. He was talking to the um, charge nurse in the ICU, and she said, you know, 
Ali, gosh, these kids are so smart, you know, that are coming in as these new doctors, but we have to do all these checklists, you know, check off the central line insertion, check off this. And she's like, but they don't know who needs a central line and they don't know who needs how to manage the complications. She's like, we're like missing the forest for the trees. And so he really started thinking about that and then brought in this concept of trust as well, which I think is really important. Very different if you say, would you trust so-and-so to do X, Y, Z versus a Likert form that's deconstructed into the competencies. It's a very different lens and frame as we think about pr promoting people. But he breaks trust down into these four conditions. And I'll just briefly talk about each because I think as we think about the construct of our residencies, we're going to have to possibly think about some residency redesign to some extent. And we hope EPAs can help be a proxy for enhancing some of these things. But you know, ability, integrity, reliability, humility. So ability, what can they do? You have to have worked with them to some extent or have a proxy for that, which we'll show you how EPAs can help with that for what can they do. Um, integrity, do they do, do they, are they honest? Are they truthful? When they call you from the bedside, are they at the bedside? Um, have they done consistently what they've said they were going to do in the past? Reliability, um, being predictable and humility. And I think this last one is really important. And this is a broad and trustability feature that doesn't come through in the micro assessments that when we do EPAs, which is, do they know their boundaries? Will they ask for help? So somebody could be incredible in the operating room. They've gotten all practice ready on those individual micro assessments, but if they won't call you, they don't know their boundaries and they won't ask for help and they're not practice ready and trustable, right? Because we all know we all need help sometimes. And the people who are most dangerous are those who push too far and don't ever ask for help. So these are kind of the big constructs of trust that have to be brought back into the CCC process that may or may not be um, able to be assessed in a single uh, clinical encounter, but are something that you sort of know um, at the end of the rotation. This is what our end of rotation evaluation focuses on now. We have shrunk it mightily because we now have the EPAs and um, we have good engagement around the EPAs. But these are the things that we want people to think about and talk about at the end of the rotation, because these are the kind of all the accumulation of experiences that come together. But it also means we need to work and have enough contact with our residents to be able to answer these questions. And what has happened historically with the assessment and evaluation, which the EPA should help with is everybody's like, well, I only operated with them once or I only had this happen. But if they were, ha if everybody's having a bad day, but they're not talking about it, then we're not helping that resident get plugged in with help and support. So um, we're not finding this out at PGY four year, which is what has happened historically because we haven't had visibility to these things. So Ollie and his colleague developed this concept of an entrustable professional activity. So getting away from the checklist and the breaking everything down into its component parts and said, you know, what do we do every day? What do you want in your surgeon or your doctor? Um, which was really this concept of workplace-based assessment. So what do we, you know, what do I do every day? I take care of patients with pancreas cancer, or I take care of patients with um, precursors to pancreas cancer, or I might take out some gallbladders. Um, but so I want my surgeon to know how to evaluate and manage a patient with that problem. I want them to plan for the operation. I want them to manage the complications. I want them to make the right clinical judgments. And I want them to be excellent um, in doing the operation. And so that has lots of competencies under the hood, if you will, that touches patient care, technical skills, medical knowledge, communication, all of those things. But I, as a faculty member, never need to know anything about the competencies or the milestones ever again. I just need to know how well do they do at that, that workplace-based activity or task of taking care of that patient. There are other people, your program director, Dr. Spain and the CCC will need to know about the competencies, but nobody else does um, ever again. <laughs> so, um, so EPAs really were brought forth. And I remember Frank Lewis um, calling me when I was still in Dallas. I was driving down the highway. He, and when Frank gets excited about things, he doesn't even say hello. He's like, Rebecca, what are we going to do about the EPAs or general surgery? There's going to be like 450 of them. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is like a roll-up exercise. It's not just relabeling everything, every checklist we have as an EPA. That's not what an EPA is. An EPA is a rolling up sort of discrete element of surgical care that we can relate to. So again, lots of things wrapped up in taking care of a patient with pancreas cancer or evaluating and managing a patient with gallbladder disease. It's not deconstructing. So as you all know, there's only 18 EPAs for all of general surgery. Um, and if you talk to Ollie, there should never be more than 20 to 40 for any discipline, P 
period um, because it is a lumping exercise, not a splitting exercise. And the idea is this, this is a floor, not a ceiling. So it's starting with the end in mind. So it's saying what should every graduating general surgery resident or fill in the blank with fellow, whatever kind of resident you might train, what should they be able to do independently when they graduate? What should we be able to tell the public that if you're board certified in this discipline, you can do these things. They can do other things. And the beauty of this is once they're practice ready and trustable in the core, then you can start adding on other EPAs, fellowship level EPAs, or let them dive deeper in the areas that they have um, planned to have as part of their future practice. But we can say with much greater confidence that they can do all of these core of things. Um, and again, this concept that is anchored in trust. Would you trust this individual to care for your family member or yourself um, across these 18 EPAs? So as was mentioned, there was a pilot. There were five um, initial EPAs. Um, I, I love that you mentioned that general surgery has changed. It was very difficult to get to this list because we had to find something that everybody would agree was part of general surgery, and that is actually hard today. So these were the five that everybody could agree on. And uh, again, just to think about what's, what are the components of an EPA, the EPA is the task, evaluate and manage a patient with pancreas cancer. Under the hood, the framework of the assessment is that there are five to seven milestones and competencies mapped to that. And then we, we define what does this look like when we see it for different levels of entrustment. So specific observable behaviors are described to create a shared mental model for how we need to progress people along the continuum of training. But the faculty really just have to look at those observed behaviors as aligned with the tasks. They never will have to worry about the mapped milestones. So the entrustment scale that we settled on was um, limited participation in the pilot. It was observation only. I mean, we don't ever have people just observing typically, we hope in residency. So limited participation is that sort of entry level of entrustment, direct supervision. So here's an example. So if this was the EPA of captaining a sailboat, Dr. Dua and Dr. DeLong being directly supervised by Dr. Han, who you can't see um, behind her, <laughs> hands on the wheel. And if I could play the video, Dr. Dua is saying to Dr. DeLong, now this is what we call smooth sailing, John. <laughs> now we'll talk, <laughs> we'll talk about whether that was good feedback or not in a future slide. So um, then it goes on to indirect supervision. So um, you might be in the room or outside of the room, but um, the, the trainee is able to progress things, you know, on their own, but we'll call for help um, and support as needed and then practice ready. So Dr. Morris and Dr. Dua are practice ready at selecting and opening and distributing beer on the boats, but we are definitely all needed direct supervision for sailing the boats. And Dr. Hahn was very brave to take all of us out um, without more help. So what is the entrustment scale not? I think this is really important. And this is something the Canadians are really struggling with. This is not a Likert scale. You would expect that, and, and it doesn't align with PGY year either. People are gonna bounce all around um, and some EPAs are gonna be practice ready earlier in training at PGY three year. And some might only get to indirect supervision by the PGY five year. Um, our goal is everybody would be to indirect supervision and practice ready. We had a lot of conversation about that. Um, Initially, everybody said everybody has to be practice ready, but we didn't want to drive people to use the scale incorrectly. And some of these EPAs, we don't know if they're going to be fully practice ready. Things like thyroid, parathyroid, not all of our training programs in the United States will our trainees get enough experience, but they might be ready for indirect supervision and have a partner in practice that's going to help them in, in, as they move into practice with that. So importantly, it is not a generic autonomy scale. It's not a Likert scale. It has these behavioral anchors that we're gonna talk a little bit more about. And ideally, as you give feedback, it should be anchored to those descriptive behaviors. And you should say, here's, I'm picking direct supervision because here's what I saw anchored back to the behaviors. And here's what I need to see for you to get to the next level of entrustment. So it should always be forward looking, telling the trainees what they need to do next. And for the trainees, for the first time ever, we're giving them a roadmap of what they should look like to progress. So rather than sort of showing up in the operating room and having to guess um, what we would like for them to look like um, to make progress. And so it does provide a blueprint if you read those behavioral anchors for those EPAs. And importantly, they're not a checklist. And this is really different than kind of the approach that's been taken in, uh, with CBD. 
and where they're sort of circling back to being interested in, in a system more like ours. So you can see here, there are some, there's a descriptive behavior. Um, there were several apps developed during the pilot and we'll show you a few of these. They're, the best features of all are being pulled into the simple app. Um, not all there yet, but the hope is that they will be in the future. But the idea here is then you pick the level and then you just dictate the feedback that's anchored um, to that behavioral description and then say, what do they need to do to get to level three? There was broad participation in the pilot. This was really a feasibility pilot. And again, we, this is where we developed a lot of the tools and learned a lot in terms of implementation, which um, led to the ABS investing in providing the tools um, with respect to the app and, and hopefully subsequently the, the analytics and dashboard, which we'll talk about, which will be really key as they continue their development. Um, and from there, there was a commitment to moving forward with developing the 18 EPAs, which are shown here. So these are the 18 EPAs that we would expect all of our trainees um, to be entrustable in uh, by the time to, in order to be eligible to sit for their boards. This starts with the incoming class this year. So um, we rolled it out for everybody because you're not gonna roll something out and try to automate the behavior with just one class of residents. Um, but these are the these are the 18, and as Dr. Hahn mentioned, vascular surgery is close, hotly behind, um, and then CGSO, PEDS, um, critical care. We also have EPAs for a lot of the fellowships. So AES has developed EPAs in the same exact way, and the fellowship council for all of the fellowship council EPAs. And I know Transplants working on EPAs now as well through Kelly Collins and some other folks. So the nice thing is, we as a community, we've developed them all the same way in the same structure, so that for faculty, they um, get used to that framework, and for trainees coming up from residency to fellowship, it will be the same sort of assessment framework. So what has to change? So importantly, what's so nice about this is that it really aligns with what do we do every day already with respect to doing the microassessments. We make ad hoc entrustment decisions every single day. And this is again from Sincati's work. So this, this is where we're gonna use our microassessments. So when somebody calls you in the middle of the night and they tell you about your patient who's back in the emergency department, you're instantly thinking like, does the story make sense based on what I know? Is their plan correct? Is their differential correct? Um, you might you know, tweak it a little bit and then you do one or three things, right? You roll over and go back to sleep and say, sounds great. Um, and you sleep well, you ask a lot of questions and you're uncertain and then, um, or you get out of bed and go in and see the patient because you don't have um, entrustment that they have the right plan or that they need help or whatever the answer might be. But we do this all day long. Um, we do it in the operating room when we decide how much um, trust to impart to the person standing across the table from us. The piece that's been missing is what do we do? How do we capture all of those decisions we're making every single day? And we've done a lot of work looking at assessment. And the only, what I love about this approach is that the only thing, if you do factor analysis that actually in an assessment shows um, and aligns with progression and, and how trainees are doing is that final summative overall assessment that we all do at the end of the evaluation. And that has been shown over and over again. That's what this is. This is saying like, what is with these sorts of behaviors? How do we feel like this person is doing and progressing, but how do we capture that data in a formal way and use it to make higher level decisions? So how do we create then that transparency for where they are in their training? And that really then gets to be the CCC. And I'm, where I'm gonna to go to next here is really showing you how these analytics can be so powerful and so valuable to all the different stakeholders. So to achieve this vision, again, we learned in the pilot, you have to have enabling tools and analytics or it just becomes a big black hole. So I'm gonna just show you an example of, um, this is our app, the simple app works similarly. Um, I just don't, wasn't able to get a video of that because we don't have that. So here you can see you're gonna select your trainee. This literally takes 38 seconds to complete. Um, so we're gonna show you a fellow one. So here, MIS fellowship, it's gonna be a foregut um, EPA. Again, all the same structure. So it, it's exactly the same structure. If you're a resident, you could do the fellow level EPAs when you're on the MIS and bariatric service. Um, and so they're gonna pick it. They're gonna pick their phase of care. You know, the way that we interface with trainees, we may not get to see all three phases. So we purposely separated those phases into pre, intra, and post-op, scroll back and forth to see what's the right, the right level. Um, and this can be initiated by either the trainee or the faculty member. 
our trainees are required to self-assess that I was, I will show you has proven to be really helpful and important information. And then you provide um, the feedback and then you get a notification over here in the middle to um, the person who hasn't completed it yet. So I think here faculty initiated, then it's going to trainee or vice versa. And so they get the assessment sent to them and then they do the same thing and assess. And then once both are complete in the third panel there, then it comes back to the, um, to the trainee. They're able to see their self-assessment versus the faculty self-assessment. And so you can see in this instance, um, they're slightly discordant. So um, the trainee said that they were ready for supervising others. This was just a different scale. And the faculty said they were um, at unsupervised practice. So um, slightly discordant. And then you look at the feedback and they see how concordant that feedback is. So that's the, the in the moment micro assessment it takes 38 seconds. You can do it walking out the door of the operating room. Um, and it's very easy to do. And the simple app does exactly the same thing. Um, very easy to enter that assessment. I would strongly encourage that you just automate the behavior and do it every time. Um, that's what we also learned in the pilot that when you only did it occasionally, it's really hard to remember. So um, we also learned in the pilot that it cannot be a black hole. So there has to be perceived value of doing this. So initially the trainees were doing all these EPAs and then like the faculty weren't responding. And it's very hard to keep them engaged <laughs> if the faculty aren't responding um, or we're not doing anything with the data. So it was sort of dumping into this, you know, this black hole and not coming back to them to be useful or valuable to them. So we really learned and felt strongly during the pilot that analytics were key to success. And this again is um, something Dr. Mellinger is working on actively with, with a simple team to bring all of the, the best things that we've learned across all these different apps into um, a unified analytic platform. But if you automate the behavior and then you use the information, um, that will create a self-fulfilling cycle going forward um, in terms of getting people engaged. So I always think of this through the lens of these four stakeholder groups. Um, obviously there are other stakeholders here like patients things, but we're gonna just focus on implementation and how do we create value for these four different groups. So let's start with the resident. So the resident lens. So what's most valuable without question to the residents is the qualitative feedback. So even though I understand it's, in a, we require qualitative feedback every single time. And there's a few jerks who put like period so they can get out of the app, but most don't. <laughs> most people are good about giving feedback. Now it's not all high quality feedback, but um, a lot of it is. And then we work on faculty development so that it becomes better. But what the trainees get the most out of is that actual qualitative feedback. So it's really important to do that every single time and just build that into your practice. You can dictate it, it's very fast. The numbers in isolation without that feedback doesn't tell them how to progress, right? Doesn't tell them why you picked that level, doesn't tell them how to get to the next level. So important. If you're a resident preparing for a case, this is an example of our dashboard. You can, and the faculty can see the same things, but so they might say, you know, they're going to go do a cholecystectomy. So this is a resident over a few, um, you know, kind of PGY2 to 4. You can see they're moving up to that left um, place. The red dots are faculty and the blue dots are the residence assessments. They can pick a dot and look and see the feedback um, that they had. They can look at all the feedback and look for themes, which I'll show you in a moment, but they can really sort of see where they are, what trajectory are they on. And ideally, they would also share this with the faculty um, to, to help create that trust by proxy, because even if it's the first time they're doing this case with me, if I see this data and know they've done all of these cases with all of my colleagues and they come to me and say, hey, look, here's where I am and here's what I'm working on, that, that allows me to give them more autonomy in, the, in that interaction. They can take all of their data and look qualitatively and you can see some of this feedback is not so helpful and others are more helpful. Our big focus for faculty development right now is the forward looking piece of what would you do, what should you do to progress but when I look through all of this data, there's definitely a theme that comes through here around it being more assertive, moving the case forward. There are several faculty who point to that. And so you can instantly see it. You can instantly see, okay, well, this is something that we're going to work on for you um, because we're seeing this from multi across multiple cases and multiple assessors. The faculty can see the same thing. 
Um, we have surveyed the faculty. The faculty feel like this is so much better than the horrible 20 item plus end of rotation evaluations. They have felt like this is so much better. Um, and they have access to the same information as the residents. However, I would say it's really on the residents to bring to the faculty before a case to say, here's where I am. Here's, um, here's what I'm working on. And because the faculty just aren't going to do that, right? They're unlikely to log into the dashboard before the case. They're busy. Um, they've got lots of other competing things going on. And it's really the resident who wants them to know. I think the faculty then once they know are very happy to to think about it differently, but I would say this is one piece, this is very much a shared responsibility, but the, the piece of letting someone know where you are, I think really does fall with the residents. This is an example of an um, aspect of the app that Dr. Lindemann's team developed in their app, um, which is awesome and which we're incorporated in. And I know um, the simple team is working on, which says even in the app, you could look, these are the endocrine EPAs and see, okay, where are they? How many assessments have they had? Um, what, you know, what were the average of the last five? And that again, gives you a starting point. It changes your frame of, you know, is this one, let me show you how I like to do this case, even though, you know, it's the first time you're doing it with them, but they might've done it 30 other times. So it's using the tools and the analytics to make it more visible, to make it easier to trust, to provide more independence and autonomy, and then accelerate the learning curve for the trainees. So then, the clinical competency committee. The clinical competency committee does need to worry about the milestones because they still have to report them to the ACGME, but they also are gonna be bringing in lots of other data points, right? Like they're gonna have all the EPA data. They have a lot of data to process. And so it has to be um, intuitive and useful to them. So this was just, you know, again, from the pilot, the first five EPAs just immediately can get a snapshot. One of the things I noticed right away in this data is that this training consistently underestimates their behavior compared to faculty. The blue dots are almost always below the red dots. That's important, right? From the standpoint of giving feedback because if somebody lacks confidence in their abilities, they're gonna to tend to hang back in the operating room and then they might be given less opportunities for training. Conversely, and we don't see this very often, if somebody's overestimating their abilities over and over, that's a different conversation, right? Um, the good news is we actually see that very rarely. We do see gender differences where women tend to underestimate their ability more frequently than men. The men don't overestimate, they're just more consistently accurate with the faculty. Um, and so we're continuing to explore those things and what that might mean from a you know, faculty and resident development standpoint. But you can see that right away in the data. You can then, if you know your hawks and doves, if you can hover over a dot and see who it is, um, because you know you might have some outlier dot, and then you're like, Dr. Spain's like, you know, that's so and so. They won't ever give anybody a good, you know, assessment. <laughs> but it it allows you to just get that big picture view and and start to um, quickly dive into sort of where people are. The other thing you can see is that, you know, in general, you're seeing them move upwards, right? Like they're on an upward trajectory with their entrustment, which is what you want to see. If you had a resident, though, that was flat and the dots were not moving up as a higher level of entrustment, then that's also going to show you right away. This is somebody who is struggling. And in internal medicine and one of the programs in Cincinnati, which are further ahead of us in this, what they found, it turns out that actually attrition is very similar in internal medicine to surgery. And they had the same problem we had in terms of finding people late, you know, it was after the second year. Now they have not seen a change in attrition, but they find people much earlier. And I think one of our goals here is that we wanna find people who are having a hard time much, much earlier so we can help them. Because once somebody gets labeled as the quote, struggling resident, then people don't give them opportunities. They pull back from opportunities and then it just becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So having visibility very early to somebody who might need more support and more help is one of our key goals here. And now we'll have data to see that. This is kind of the workhorse for an individual EPA. You can see all of the comments at the bottom. You can also see the, the sort of roll up in terms of the entrustment, how many assessments they've had, what is the, um, the and I don't know all the statistics behind this, my team, share, but it's kind of a rolling average where we look at the most recent ones and they'll give you the confidence interval. So here we have a pretty tight confidence interval with for the intra-op with a 4.4 entrustment level. So that middle box with a high degree of confidence based on 21 different assessments. So we can feel pretty good about that data, about where that person is. 
Um, you can see the milestone report, which I'll show you here in a moment, um, which again, our CCC needs to worry about. Overall, we found in the pilot, and I think we'll continue to find, and I, I know um, some of you all are interested in looking at the pre and post operative decision making piece of this. And we need to think about how we're going to do a better job of having more opportunities for that, because we turns out we don't actually witness a lot of the pre operative and post operative decision making. Um, and so the pre and post op phases of care, we're going to, I think, need to really focus on how we're going to get more assessments there. So your program director and program coordinator still have to turn in their milestones. So this is a really nice feature where, again, the milestones are under the hood of the EPAs. So this gives you a starting point for your milestone discussion. So it shows the milestone, shows what their projected estimated milestone level is. You can see based on how many assessments and how many assessors. Um, so that helps you decide you know, how confident you are in the data. If we look down here at PC2, which is interoperative, um, uh, performance of a procedure, we, we, it's 4.31. Confidence interval is a little bit wide, but we see that this is 32 assessments, 13 assessors. We can feel pretty good about this. And this is a senior residence data. And so if you, you know, PC2, these are more junior level cases. And this was a PGY5, so they'd already done their trauma rotation in PGY4. So it sort of conceptually makes sense. It's up to the CCC to adjust. They can adjust that milestone based on other data points that they may have from other places. Um, but it gives you a really nice starting point with way more data than we've ever had before. That's so much better than the end of rotation evaluation data for milestone information. This one is an interesting one in terms of general surgery consultation. You can see we only have five assessments, but there is a wide range. And what we did in our program was we engaged our emergency medicine colleagues um, to provide feedback on this EPA. And it turns out that we have had huge blind spots. Um, we have fantastic residents. Um, but if you think about who the customer is for the consult, it's actually not us. You know, we're assessing them on their differential and their medical knowledge and did they come up with the right answer? But we're, we don't have any visibility to how well they communicated with the patient family. Did they respond in a timely way? Were they professional to the person who asked for the consult? And so we found, and they do our trauma um, eval as well, they look at totally different things. So we get visibility to things much more related to professionalism and communication from their assessments that we never really had visibility to before from our surgeons. And it gives us a much more holistic view. And so this is one where you, know, you might dive in and say, well, let's look at those five you know, EPA microassessments in the comments and see if there's something there. Is there some signal where they're really smart, they're getting the right answer, but maybe they weren't as nice as they needed to be when they got called to see the patient. So again, you know, it gives you a really nice starting point with the analytics of where to look um, and hopefully makes that work a lot easier. So how do you get people to do this? Um, we did a lot. Um, Jay Greenberg really gets credit for this is obviously just pulled off the web, but um, we have used leaderboards and, you know, pushing people competitively for faculty and residents. That works to a point. Um, Karen Brazel tells me, you know, it's just you, nobody cares. <laughs> They're at the top or the bottom. I'm like, well, so every program is different in terms of how competitive people are, but um, these are tools that you can use. Um, we, like you all, have now embedded this in our education incentive, and so our faculty have a minimum number of EPAs they're required to do per month, and we provide these analytics back to our faculty um, division chairs, so when they look at their all their different metrics, they look at their EPA metrics every month. With When July came, um, you can see down at the bottom, we had a pretty, um, we already had great engagement with our acute care group, but we definitely saw a bump in our, our other four general surgery divisions. Um, with just putting this in place with structure. I think most importantly, if you look down here at the, at the non-response rates, one of our biggest dissatisfiers again for the residents were that we had the faculty were had double the non-response rate of the trainees, and that was a huge dissatisfier. And we have really worked hard by providing these data back and by um, using some of these leaderboards. We had faculty who were like, what do you mean I didn't respond? I didn't get the notification. And so then we could go and it turns out they had notifications turned off on their phone and they weren't getting the notifications. So we were able to sort of troubleshoot it. And now we have, you know, we would like to get that number even lower for both trainees and residents, but at least it's equal. It's no longer the residents are putting them in and the faculty aren't responding. They have equal non-response rates and we're gonna keep working at making that lower. This is an example of a summary division report for acute care um, group. And, you know, obviously they rotate on different weeks. So this is just July's report. 
but you can see they've gotten their non-response rate down really, really low. They do a really great job um, in terms of responding. And so this is data that you know Ben shares with his team. And, um, and again, it's reinforcing because people don't want to be in, in there. It's actually, I think this works better at a division level because there's more visibility and people don't want to be the one that, that um, isn't doing it. But now it's also tied to their um, education incentive. And I think this is really important. So it is equally shared. So half the time the trainee initiates, half the time the faculty. I always do it as initiator because I have to do it when I walk out of the room or I will forget to do it. Um, and so I always do it while the trainee is finishing up um, and then they respond secondarily. We have other faculty who always wait for the trainee to initiate. Again, the goal is to do this every single time um, because that's where the data is most valuable. It's where you're getting lots of feedback from lots of different people over time. If um, if you cherry pick and you only, you know, it's also important that people, this is what I heard again in Canada, like the trainees only pick a case where they feel like they did, it went really well and we're not able to initiate. It, it just needs to be every single time. Um, and because both people can initiate, if you automate that behavior, that goes away. That becomes a non-issue because everybody can initiate and we're just doing it every single time. So just coming kind of back to, to Again, the why and where we started, I think, you know, EPAs really are an assessment framework. And again, the milestones are there, but they're under the hood and our faculty don't need to know about them anymore because they just aren't sort of, they don't sort of intuitively make sense to how we take care of patients. They're important, but, um, but they're not sort of at that point of, of learning and training um, immediately visible there can't be a black hole phenomenon. So what, where this starts to have value is when you can roll that data up and it tells a story over time. And so the more data that you have, the better the story and the easier for our trainees to see the themes and the feedback and to make progress. And the residents really are the ones who need to use those summary analytics to drive their opportunity. Um, because if you bring that to the faculty, most faculty are not gonna say no um, in terms of the, um, when, they, when you show them this data to give them more opportunity. And the faculty have got to give feedback and it needs to be forward looking. Um, and if we can really leverage these summary analytics to reinforce that engagement um, over and over again, then it will become automated over time. And I think, you know, Dr. Beiske has been really clear that our goal here is just progressive engagement. <laughs> um, so this is a huge seismic shift for folks. Obviously, you know, I care a lot about this. And so, you know, in my department, I'm able to help shepherd this forward, but that may not be true in every single general surgery training program out there. People have different kinds of resources. So our goal is really to try to bring the tools and help people understand the value and the why so we can move this forward. And that's why, again, it's starting with new class of residents, but I would strongly encourage that you do this for all of your residents, not just the incoming class, because it's hard to automate otherwise. So again, just in closing, coming back to that why, you know, we were dissatisfied with our current assessment systems. Are EPAs perfect? Nope, but they're definitely better than current state. Competency framework's been artificial. EPAs just make sense to what we do every single day and the faculty don't have to dissect things any longer. And it does create the opportunity, which I probably won't happen in my lifetime, but if we can start, as they've done in the Netherlands, you know, have transparency for progressive entrustment, you could imagine where we could have serial credentialing for autonomy within train, um, for autonomy uh, in training. Um, and you know, our hope is, we don't know yet, but our hope is, is that EPAs will help us have a more homogeneous product. Again, floor, not ceiling, but we also hope it'll help our trainees get a lot further along um, during their training. Because again, once they've met that core, they can start working on other things as well. So thank you so much for the invitation and um, happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm.